Okay, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on, on where you are. Um, we like to do these because it's Latin America. We host them in the afternoon in London, but obviously it's morning for many of you in Latin America if you're tuning in. Uh, so thank you for a, a timely presentation and discussion on uh, with two uh, preeminent scholars and experts on the countries we'll be discussing. Uh, as many of you know, there are elections held June 6th, uh, the second round elections in Peru, uh, pitting uh, Castillo against Keiko Fujimori, and of course, the uh, midterm elections in Mexico for the 500 seats of the lower house of the Mexican Congress, as well as 15 governorships and uh, a handful, 30 in total out of 32 state legislatures. So here to talk to us about those results and their implications for politics, but also economic policy in those countries, because there's a lot at stake, even in the case of Mexico in the midterm elections, our first, Andres Rosenthal, who's uh, familiar, I'm sure, to many of you. Uh, he is the Dean of the Foreign Service, effectively, in, in Mexico. He's been ambassador to Sweden. He was ambassador to the UK. He was vice foreign minister, and he's the eminent ambassador uh, of Mexico, and also on the senior policy advisor board uh, at Chatham House. And if you will, the founder of the Latin America Initiative in Chatham House. The second is Lucia Dammer. She is a Peruvian, but lives in Chile now, she's a professor at the Universidad del Chile of International Relations, and she's a sociologist. She'll be talking about the Peruvian elections. I'm going to try to run this panel a little bit Davos style uh, to have more of a discussion, then we'll open it up to all the other participants that we have here, because there's obviously a lot on the table and a lot of dimensions that we can cover. Uh, before I do so, I want to thank the sponsors of the Latin American Initiative, HSBC, Karen Energy, Equinor, uh, BTG Pactual, as well as um, Presnio, who uh, actually is very active with us in our Mexico program. So Andres, let me start with you. Um, you know, there seem to be two narratives coming out of this election. On the one hand, there seems to be, even in the media, a certain amount of celebration that, that AMLO, the president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, did not uh, um, get even what he, the, his party had before, Morena had before, in terms of a majority. Um, and it did not even get a supermajority to allow it to, to uh, amend the Constitution. Uh, relatively easily. But of course, they did do quite well. They won a majority of the state legislatures. They won 11 of the governorships. And of course, in coalition, they will be having a majority uh, in, in Congress, although not a majority just only of Morena. How do we interpret these elections? Thank you, um, Chris. Thank you for having me. I think the best way to interpret uh, the elections in Mexico relates to two historically uh, clear phenomena that uh, occur uh, almost every cycle, electoral cycle. The first is that in midterm elections, the ruling party, uh, ruling coalition, tends to lose seats. Uh, that has been the case in all of the Mexican uh, elections, midterm elections, since Carlos Salinas de Gortari was president. And the second one is that because of the results, and I can get into that in a little bit more detail if you like, uh, the results were mixed for López Obrador himself. Uh, interestingly enough, he wasn't on the ballot, obviously, because he has a fixed six-year term, and this was only three years into it, but he very clearly uh, wanted this election to be a referendum on him on him, on the fourth transformation, as he calls it, on his three years of government. And uh, so he inserted himself uh, very directly into the uh, elect election uh, itself, uh, to the extent even that he, had been, he was admonished by our electoral, our independent electoral authorities, uh, that he was uh, 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 violating the law by uh, speaking during the last part of the campaign uh, on uh, issues relating to other candidates, other parties, and so on. So uh, on, on the first side, uh, that is on the traditional uh, occurrence uh, after a, in a midterm election, they lost 50 seats. Morena lost 50 seats in the lower house. That was the only chamber that was up for election. The Senate is a six year term like the president's, but the whole of the lower house was up for election, 500 seats 
of which 300 are direct election and 200 are uh, plurinominales, as we call them. So party, party list uh, and party result um, uh, candidates. Uh, on that, uh, he lost, uh, as you said, his supermajority that he had with his coalition partners, um, uh, the PT and the Green Party, uh, and now uh, only enjoys a simple majority, that is 50% plus one, uh, in the lower house with his coalition partners. Morena itself didn't even make the simple majority that it already had uh, previously. Uh, the second uh, important issue, I think, is the fact that he inserted himself into the election uh, as, a, as a way of, of uh, finding out how people felt about him and about his government. And there the results are mixed. Uh, in the 15 governorships that were up for, for election, uh, Morena and Morena and or their coalition partners won 11 of those uh, 15. Uh, four were won by opposition candidates, including Nuevo Leon, the industrial capital of Mexico, and uh, a, a very important part of the uh, economic well-being of, of the country. Uh, he also lost, and this is probably the most important uh, thing that happened as far as his personal uh, relationship to the electorate, he lost uh, a good deal in Mexico City and also in Guadalajara and Monterrey. Uh, Mexico City is the bastion of the Morena Party. It was formed here in the capital and it has been governed by Morena uh, by itself for the last 20 years. And um, having lost more than half of the municipalities that were up for election, um, this is a, a big defeat for, for him personally and for Morena. So if you ask me how these results will affect uh, the political and economic direction uh, of the second half of AMLO's administration, I think they will have a very uh, direct and uh, important effect. On the one hand, politically, uh, as always happens right after the midterms, uh, the succession race begins. So uh, we are now already fully into the uh, uh, discussion and the uh, rumorology of who and, and how many are going to be up for uh, succeeding Lopez Obrador at the end of his six-year term. If he had any intentions of extending his mandate, uh, which a lot of analysts feel that is basically what he would like, uh, I think those are dashed uh, with uh, the results of the election. I don't think he has the slightest possibility of doing that. So his will be a six-year term, uh, although there is a recall referendum which will be held in March of next year. Uh, he pushed through a constitutional amendment to get that recall um, uh, put into the Constitution. Uh, so presumably we will have to vote on whether he should stay in office uh, in March of next year for the remainder of his term or whether he should say goodbye. Uh, I believe strongly that that recall referendum will not make a big difference whatsoever. He will probably win it uh, because they will get the people who support him out to vote, while as a lot of others won't particularly be interested in voting. The second important political consequence is that the middle class in Mexico, which he really dislikes intensely, even though he is from the middle class, he dislikes it intensely because it is not subservient to him and it's not subservient to his policies and his strategies uh, in government. And that middle class, he didn't pay any attention to during the campaign. He dedicated all of his time and energy to keeping his base together so that he could be sure of having at least that part of his support uh, in the midterms. 
And of course, the middle class uh, isn't happy with his uh, government, isn't happy with him, and voted very strongly against him and against Morena as a representative of, of his, own, uh, his own administration. Uh, and that is only going to increase between now and the end of this administration. So it is highly likely that there will be even more of the middle class that will not be particularly in favor of an extension, uh, not of his mandate, but an extension of Morena and Morena's policies and the so-called fourth transformation. Finally, the economic issue uh, also, I think, uh, is, is, is affected. We've had a very poor period during the Lopez Obrador administration in terms of economic performance. We have lost eight and a half percent of our GDP last year and uh, lost a little bit of our GDP the year before. Uh, this year may be uh, a better year in terms of growth, but it still won't be enough to make up the loss of the first three years of his administration. And so uh, all of the unemployed, all of the small and medium sized industries and, and the economic entities that uh, uh, exist in Mexico uh, have uh, to see uh, the results, not only of that, but also of the pandemic. And uh, given that Lopez Obrador uh, was one of the very few world leaders to decide not to help any of the small, medium-sized uh, entities in the economy, um, other than to give money handouts to the lower class and to his core support group, uh, a lot of those are also suffering and will continue to suffer through the next three years of the administration, undoubtedly, especially if the pandemic continues to affect uh, the reopening of the economy uh, fully, which will probably not happen until the end of this year or beginning of next year. So I think there are clear impacts of the midterm elections. Uh, for the both political and economic direction of the country. Let me ask just two quick follow-up questions before we turn to, to Peru and Lucia. Uh, the first is, you know, it's been very, he's engaged in a series of, let's say, rollbacks on contracts for international investment, uh, particularly in the energy sector. What do you think this will mean in terms of uh, that plan? He obviously was, uh, there were rumors that he was planning a, a reform of the constitution to allow him to claw back some of that uh, allowance for international investment. Um, is that on hold? And then in the second question, in a little more fuzzy, if you will, you know, Emlo is famous for his mañaneras, his morning conferences. Has he toned down his rhetoric a little? I mean, those became sort of a, a gripe session for him of naming, you know, enemies real and imagined. Um, has, has, has he, has he pull back a little on those or is he still full uh, of, 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 of vim and vigor, as we would say? I'll answer your second question first by telling you that he hasn't changed a bit. Uh, ever since the election, he has continued to do exactly what he was doing before, uh, attacking institutions, attacking individuals, attacking the middle class, attacking in the, uh, uh, the private sector in general. Uh, so that hasn't changed. Uh, but I, what has changed, and I think that's important, is that the mañanera itself uh, today is probably seen or listened to by many fewer people than it was early on in the uh, first part of his administration. Because at the first part, this was a novel uh, thing. Uh, previous uh, governments in Mexico were not particularly friendly to the media, didn't want to... Uh, get out there to be questioned. Now, of course, the Mañanera is a, is, is a uh, show because the journalists who sit there and ask the questions are not journalists in the true sense of the word. Most of them are plants uh, by the uh, administration to ask questions that the administration wants to have answered. And the rest are social media, uh, small social media outlets that uh, really do not represent the mainstream media of Mexico. 
Um, so that's changed. And I think fewer and fewer people will be listening or seeing, watching his Mañaneras going forward. Um, on the uh, energy issue or on the relationship, if you like, with the foreign and, and domestic private sector, um, López Obrador still has the intention, and he has announced it, to uh, present constitutional reform proposals to roll back the energy reform, all of it, not just parts of it, all of it. Uh, but, of course, having lost his majority, uh, he cannot push that through, uh, even with his allied parties. And most probably, those constitutional reform proposals will fall by the wayside uh, in Congress, first in the lower house and also in the upper house. The uh, uh, attempt that he already has made to change laws without changing the Constitution, to make it more difficult for the private sector, both foreign and domestic, to work in Mexico in the energy, especially in the hydrocarbon and in the electricity sectors, uh, have all been suspended uh, by the judiciary as being presumably unconstitutional. And so uh, until such time as our Supreme Court gets a hold of these cases, which may be a year or two uh, or to the end of his administration, those attempts have failed. And uh, the other ones that he has announced uh, will fail, I'm sure, also. Now, there are many ways, and he has been very adept in his administration, at finding uh, ways around changes to laws and changes to the Constitution by administrative actions that make life difficult for investors in Mexico, not just in the energy sector, altogether. Uh, both domestic, Mexican, and, and foreign. And uh, we already have uh, two cases uh, on being uh, adjudicated under the new trilateral trade agreement, the uh, USMCA, or TMEC as we call it here in Mexico, in the automotive sector. And there will undoubtedly be many more coming up in the future, some having to do with labor issues, some having to do with uh, economic trade uh, traditional trade relationship issues. Um, and uh, I think that in the second part of the administration, um, without being able to roll back the energy reform, um, he will continue to make life difficult for investors. Now, we've just had a change uh, in the economic team. Uh, we will have a new Minister of Finance who will take over in July. The former Minister of Finance is being proposed to the Senate as a governor of the central bank to replace the outgoing governor. Uh, and this new uh, finance minister is much more independent-minded than the previous two that uh, López Obrador had. And it is understood that he uh, is clearly on the side of repairing relationships with the private sector, because he understands perfectly well that without private investment, domestic and foreign, uh, Mexico's economy cannot grow. And so therefore, we are looking, I am looking forward to a more friendly uh, relationship of the administration, maybe even with some changes in the cabinet, in the energy sector, maybe changes in Pemex, maybe changes in the energy ministry, uh, which will uh, go along with that uh, basic uh, 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 I've way that he sees his job going forward. Does that spell, and I'm sorry, I just want to follow up on this one question. Um, does that spell, though, that if the finance minister is confirmed for the president of the central bank, the, um, a more partisan monetary policy? I mean, obviously there are several governors, we, we know a number of them, uh, but will this, will that be a much more politicized institution? Should he get confirmed? I, he will get confirmed. I don't think, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I think the central bank values its autonomy and its independence. 
Uh, funnily enough, well, not funnily, but uh, as a proof of that, several votes that have been taken within the central bank, including the uh, central bank deputy governors that he has, Lopez Obrador, has nominated, have gone against what I would call the prevailing political winds. Uh, so uh, I don't think there will be a major change. I think the central bank will continue to be autonomous and it will continue to have as its primary objective maintaining monetary and fiscal and financial stability uh, in the country, which, by the way, has been the case for the last three years under Lopez Obrador. I'm sure he would have other ideas if he could, but uh, the fact is that he has been a fiscal and monetary conservative uh, during the first three years, and I am sure that that will continue uh, for the rest of his administration. Good. No, well, good news. Thank you very much for that. Lucia, uh, different election, different country, obviously, uh, different results. Uh, you have, uh, in, in the run runoff elections, you have still being decided, about 60,000 votes separate uh, Castillo from Fujimori. She's contesting the election, which seems to be a trend uh, around the world. Uh, extends, of course, uh, the north of, of Andres's border as well. Um, the, uh, what do you predict this means? I mean, such a close election, such highly polarizing figures. Um, and, and of course, a Congress that is divided. There are more than 10 parties in the single chamber of the Peruvian Congress uh, with uh, the vast majority, not the vast, the majority being more conservative, Castillo's party having, well, about, about 28, I guess, 30. Um, what, do you, what do you predict will happen in the presidential elections and what will this mean for governance? Hi, Christopher. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, very nice to be here. Um, and of course, listening to Andres uh, on the Mexican uh, situation is, it's always great to compare to what's going on in Peru. Um, and my main issue is that, um, you know, Castillo is, is a person that represents the crisis of the Peruvian political party system. Uh, he, but I think this context is impossible to understand without COVID-19 equation into the equation. Um, uh, as, as, as mentioned before, Peru, uh, for many years was the poster child of economic development um, with impressive performances, you know. However, the political realm was uh, basically on the side. And for many years, uh, at least since 1990, all presidents are either convicted or under investigation for corruption. Um, but also many mayors and regional presidents have faced trials for criminal acts uh, such as homicide, corruption, money laundering, and drug trafficking. So uh, in that context, rule of law is not strong in Peru, and the rule of law index shows that. Uh, Peru is on the 20th place out of 30 countries in Latin America. So this uh, division between economics and politics finally you know, collapsed with uh, COVID-19. We have more than 1 million people getting, people getting infected. 180,000 people dying, most of them realizing that there are no public hospitals, there is no oxygen, there is no help from the state. And Castillo um, was at the right moment in the right time in order to profit for that crisis. I'm pretty sure that if we waited two or three more weeks, Perhaps we will have a second runoff with Keiko and someone else, or perhaps neither Keiko will be in the runoff. So everything was really, you know, collapsing week after week because of the precariousness of the political system in Peru. Um, my sense is that uh, in Peru, Castillo has won the election. Um, you have the previous Ipsos survey that showed that Castillo will win for one or 2%. Then you have the rapid account count by Ipsos also that has never failed in the last many years that also showed that Castillo will win. And at the end, he got, you know, um, he got uh, 60 to 70,000 more votes than Keiko Fujimori. And of course she is contesting this as she did against uh, Kuczynski the last time. She 
uh, as Donald Trump, she waited five days in order to concede that Kuczynski won. Kuczynski, you know, being someone for the from the right wing type of go of politics, um, won by forty thousand votes. The difference is that Castillo is not only um, a ultra radical left wing person. He's also a highly conservative uh, person. Yeah, so he's against many of the issues that the left wing has in Lima, such as, you know, gay marriage, abortion, you know, marijuana and other and other issues that but for him are considered like a liberal. Um, so uh, he has a program of government that is very uh, much like a 70s type of uh, program. In that sense, he has uh, some links with Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador rhetoric, you know, of the transformation and the revolution and the agrarian revolution and all those, you know, uh, topics that are very important for uh, people who are in the Andes, who do not see, do not see any achievements of the economic progress that believe that the economic model is actually hindered their possibility to grow, that, per, that perceive that the economic elite and the political elite in Lima are getting more of the results of the economic model, of course, more than the rest of the country. Uh, but my sense is that he knows that it is, that program is impossible to implement. Actually, a couple of days uh, ago, his main economic advisor, Pedro Franque, did a very interesting interview here in Chile, because of course, Chile has lots of investment in Peru. He did an interview here and he said that there is no nationalization, that you know all these far left uh, wing policies are out of the conversation because he has no majority in the Congress. And of course, he has not um, been able to build a linkage with the armed forces or the police. So he has no way to you know, become a Chavez uh, because actually he's there because of a very weird situation. And he knows that, he knows that he is very, um, he and his advisors know that they are very, you know, uh, feeble in terms of actually uh, governing Peru. Um, however, my main concern resides on the contesting issue. I think that Keiko Fujimori and the, po the political and economic elite in Lima are playing hard against the democratic process. Uh, they are using the media the media has played a very uh, awful role. They have, they have not been you know, objective in this process. They have been helping Keiko Fujimori throughout the whole electoral process. And in that sense, um, of course, we are you know, uh, deepening the cleavages between the poor and the rich, between <clears throat> Lima and the rest of the country. And um, instead of uh, looking for a uh, you know, bridges to be built because there is no way that Castillo will do whatever he wants. The right wing is using this uh, Venezuelan metaphor and is using, you know, a fear in order to um, incentivize people in Lima to actually, you know, fight against the president elected. And that has a sparkle you know, more resentment from other parts of the country, such as Cusco and Ayacucho and other, you know, the mining, the mining industry, where the mining industry is located. So if, the, um, if that rhetoric continues, he could be the next president, but he will be like hostage in Lima. Uh, it will be very difficult for him to organize a government and of course, uh, we will need more, you know, uh, powerful uh, leaders to build those bridges. But of course, uh, Mario Vargas Llosa is not playing that role. And President Sagasti, actor President Sagasti, he, he is a very well-known figure in Peru. And he tried to call, you know, 
some people to build the bridges. And then um, the son of Mario Vargas Llosa actually said that he was interfering with the process. So um, everything is kind of open for, for in, interpretation. Um, however, if we continue on this path, uh, we will have more turbulent and even violent situations, unfortunately. Thank you. There are a couple of questions in the queue, but I just want to ask a follow-up question, Lucia. Um, sure. You've got two dynamics here, as you're saying. One is you know, a very polarized capital city, if you will. Businesses, I mean, do you think, um, does, I mean, if this could play out in the short term in terms of not accepting the election results and not sort of healing the country. It could also play out in the long term in terms of in the Congress. And we've seen you know, five presidents uh, you know, in a short amount of time be ousted from office over corruption charges or just um, sort of trumped up uh, uh, excuses in the case of the, the, uh, a number of them and Vizcarra being one. What yeah. is the, what is, what, <laughs> I'm not asking you to place odds on how long Castillo would last. That would be uh, uh, really uh, impolitic and unfair. But I mean, what do you think the, this means in terms of the stability of his future government and its capacity uh, to govern? Well, the government um, is going to be really difficult. One of the only uh, elements that I think we need to take into consideration is that if the Congress decides to um, vacate, to, to take him away, they, we will have a new election and they will lose their seats. And most congressmen and congresswomen, if they run again, they will not win. So there are high incentives for them to make harder to, for Castillo to do anything, but not to really take him away because otherwise they will lose their power yeah. and their agency. Um, so my sense is that, you know, if he gets into power, uh, it's going to be really difficult because he uh, is a question mark. We don't really yeah. know what he yeah. thinks and what policies was going to be implemented. Um, but it's not that easy to take him away because that and uh, and un, un, un opens uh, you know an, a new a, a new electoral process. That's that is why Keiko Fujimori's advisors are. Uh, requesting a new second runoff, not the complete process, because if you open for the complete process to be under questioning, then the, the Congress has to go out. And, you know, if you do that, it's a greater uncertainty. Uh, yeah. it's, not, it's not easy to say that now more people are with Keiko Fujimori. My sense is that many people in Lima who voted for her because he was she was the lesser evil, now are considering her under and non-democratic um, practices, yeah. um, and that will change their votes. Yeah, yeah, great. That's interesting. Uh, a little less optimistic <laughs> in the Mexico case. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a number of questions. Let's start with Dudley Ankerson. Uh, Dudley, why don't you? You'll be unmuted, and you can ask a question. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, two excellent and fascinating presentations um, on Peru. Heaven help the Peruvian people. What a terrible choice they had to make, but um, I, I wish them well. Uh, just a question for Andres. Uh, does he think that the, the PRI uh, might offer uh, AMLO a way out uh, for constitutional reform? In other words, will they sell their soul to, to AMLO in return for support for retaining a couple of governorships or some other advantage for them, personal or, or political? Uh, and in return, um, they could offer their votes in, in the Congress for constitutional reform, assuming he does decide to go for that, uh, which I think he'd like to. But like as you say, Andres, it's not far, far from certain that he will. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Dudley. You, you're not uh, you're not playing fair because you and I are having breakfast the day after tomorrow here in Mexico City. So I think uh, uh, I'll try to answer your question briefly now and then perhaps in a in a longer in a longer way uh, when we meet. Um, fair enough, Andres. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I think I think the uh, the, uh, the the story with the pre 
Uh, and also with the PAN, uh, because the PAN has more uh, seats in Congress than the PRI has, um, is, is up for grabs, if you like. Uh, so far, the coalition that the PRI, the PAN and the PRD put together uh, for the election has held, uh, and they have announced, all three of them, all three leaders of the parties, and some of the very important uh, uh, political figures within those parties that they have no intention of uh, betraying their coalition and they have no intention of supporting Lopez Obrador in constitutional reforms that go against their principles. Now, you know, our constitution gets reformed uh, every 24 hours and uh, it's extremely likely that some constitutional reforms not the major ones that Lopez would like, but some constitutional reforms could garner support from the opposition parties in the Congress, uh, whether PRI or PAN or PRD, uh, they could. And I think it'll very much depend on a case-by-case -case basis of, of what kind of constitutional reforms uh, Lopez Obrador decides to go forward with. But it's clear to me, at least, that if it's if the uh, if the constitutional reforms he wants are similar to the laws that he uh, tried to pass uh, in the first part of his administration, that is rolling back the energy reform and other constitutional reforms that are uh, that uh, go against the autonomy of the electoral institute or the central bank or the Supreme Court. Uh, those, I think, uh, are doomed. Uh, I don't think that the PRI or any of the other parties uh, would be willing to support Lopez Obrador on those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and of course, if you want to hear more on the, an answer to this question, I think Andres just basically invited you all to breakfast later with uh, <laughs> to hear more. Um, uh, let me just ask quick. So are you saying that IFE and others are the, well, the mo modern, the newly renamed uh, IFE, not are they somewhat sacrosanct? Do you think other parties, there is a consensus within the parties to protect their integrity? Not only are they, are they sacrosanct uh, with the other parties, but after the election and the way in which the election was conducted, which was exemplary, uh, I think that they have uh, gotten the support of the Mexican people. A poll that was done right after the election, asking people about what their support for INE or the old IFE was, uh, 81% nice. uh, believe that the INE should continue uh, exactly the way it is today, that is an autonomous, independent electoral body. Lopez Obrador would like to incorporate it back into the government, into the executive branch of government. I don't think that's, that's viable. That's good news, thank you. Let me go to another, some more questions. Alina Rocha Menocal, you have a question, Alina, do you? Want to unmute yourself and ask it? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. I want to have breakfast with Andres, but I fear I'm in London, so I can't do that. So I'm very jealous. But I wanted to ask about the coalition of the PAN, PRI, and the PRD, uh, because it seems to me that it does bring together quite um, a large group of people who have rather different uh, ideological views on a lot of of social issues, for example, on on gay marriage and on the use of marijuana. So I'm wondering, Andres, how do you how reliable do you think this coalition will prove across time and space? Is the antagonism to Amlo's Morena party strong enough to bring everybody together across all of these differences, or will there be some splits as a result of having sort of rather different ideological inclinations? Thank you. Thank you, Alina. That's an excellent question, one which I wish I could answer uh, definitively, but I don't think I can. Um, you know, this coalition, uh, it, it, it is, as you say, uh, made up of uh, what we call in Spanish Chile dulce y manteca, that is a little bit of everything. But um, uh, it's not as bad as the Israeli coalition that ousted uh, Mr. Netanyahu yesterday, so day before yesterday. So um, I don't know. We have to see. I think my own feeling is that all three of these parties really uh, are going to try to use their three-year 
period in the second part of AMLO's term to organize themselves, to keep the coalition going as best they can, and to begin to look at who could uh, be candidates for succeeding López Obrador in 2024. Um, whether it's PRI or PAN or, or a coalition that uh, names one candidate, which of course would be the best solution, if you like, for uh, democracy, but probably the worst solution for López Obrador. So um, I don't know, Alina. We, we just have to see uh, beyond the weeks right after the election and, and see how they, how they deal with things. What's interesting is that yesterday in Mexico City, the eight um, candidates, PAN, PRI, and others, that won municipality elections, uh, decided to get together and form a coalition in order to have their uh, views uh, better represented to the mayor of Mexico City, who is a Morenista, Claudia Sheinbaum, and also to see whether they can have a common agenda. So uh, right now, I'd say the, the stars are aligned for the coalition to keep itself together, uh, at least for a good long while. Great. That's fantastic. It's, again, a, a bit of good news. The parties can begin to cohere and seek to create an alternative. Michael Lee, you had a question. Uh, I believe it was to Lucia. Yeah, it was. Um, thank you for a, a, a really brilliant account of the, the current electoral uh, standoff that is occurring. I, I just wanted to ask that question around the role of the military and whether in Peru today they still have the potential to intervene in the political outcomes as occurred um, for example, during Alberto Fujimori's presidency when he instigated the Auto Golpe and shut down Congress and ruled by decree. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, there has been some uh, declarations uh, specifically made by uh, former generals, retire, retired generals, um, but not anyone on the armed forces now. They learned uh, from the F Fujimori time that you know, being involved in politics brings a lot of problems, uh, judiciary and otherwise. So this time, because Keiko is not really loved by, you know, perhaps no more than 15% of the population, uh, the armed forces will be, you know, giving will be uh, giving too much if he if they decided to help her to do a coup d'état or to intervene in this process. Uh, on the other hand, what they have been doing is, you know, um, organizing some rhetoric regarding the rule of law and trying to move away from these uh, declaration, these informal declarations. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we start having protests on the streets or street violence, that with the police will not be able to control, then you will have Sagasti or you know anyone will have to re, uh, request the presence of the armed forces, and and then they could start you know playing a, a bigger role. But uh, my sense is that there are no conditions now to actually do a coup d'état with uh, the armed forces. Interesting. Very nice. Uh, Saleh Kamil Saleh. Uh, you had a question, please. Yes, uh, my question is to both uh, panelists. Um, the issue of uh, resource nationalism, um, populism aside, to what extent is it um, a serious um, consideration in policy uh, terms? Uh, because you know, for, for, those of, for those of us on the other side of the hemisphere, it seems quite antiquated. So that's a question to both panelists and thank you very much. Why don't we start, Lucia, with you and then we'll go to Andres. Sure. Thank you for thank you for the question. I don't know if nationalism is so is so old. You know, when we when we listen to Donald Trump and make America great again, um, it's a it's a different type of nationalism, of course. But but it's still, you know, the whole idea of the nation against the other. Uh, and I think in Latin America, at least in Peru, that that phrase that nationalism uh, has grown stronger in the last. 
20 years. Just remember that Keiko's Fujimori um, symbol is the, is the shirt of the soccer team with you know, the national uh, flag on it. Uh, and it, they were uh, actually fighting who is more Peruvian. Um, and of course, um, uh, Castillo being uh, from the indigenous part of the Peru, of, the, of Peru, uh, they're also, he's also developing this rhetoric of, you know, the real Peruvians and nationalist um, um, elements and icons that the history has not considered. Uh, so my sense is that nationalism is, is, has always been in the Peruvian uh, political uh, discourse. Umala was a nationalist, actually his party is a nationalist party. And in, in many cases, nationalism is not only left-wing, it's throughout the political realm. Can I just ask a follow-up question? I think Saleh also is also asking about resource resources. And of course, Castillo's talked about uh, nationalizing the mine. Now he's walked that back a little bit. Um, and, and as you mentioned, Franke is, is but he's, he's one advisor among many. What's your sense of what he will may do in terms of changing the contracts under the, 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 the goose that's laying the golden egg in Peru, if you will? Yeah, well, I think um, he will not be able to nationalize uh, those industries, but he will review the contracts because that's something that Peruvians are requesting to do. I mean, that's something that in Chile is being discussed. You know, the, the way that uh, some of the extractive industries have been developing in some of, of Latin American countries are not really getting any uh, capacity building in, in, you know, in those areas. So my sense is that he will try to find a way to show uh, results. And that will be perhaps, you know, increasing taxes, or limiting the presence of some industries that are not good for the environment, even though his environmental agenda is really weak. Um, so my sense is that, uh, of course, that's an, uh, an issue that it's most uh, regarded in mining areas. If you see uh, the results, Castillo got around 92 to 95% of votes in the whole area where the mining industry is located. So, you know, people are really asking him to do something. But of course, it, it's, it's, he knows that it's not just, you know, to open the contracts and nationalize everything. Um, but my sense is that throughout Latin America, the idea that the state has to be stronger and that, um, and that the state has to play roles in, in a specific industries um, is really going stronger. Uh, not only, well, Mexico, they have the same discussion too. Uh, so that's, that's, that's present in Chile and, and it's present in Peru and Castillo will have to do something, but I'm not sure how, will, how he will manage in this very turbulent time to implement any policies against you know, these big industries that are located, uh, most of them international companies that are located in Peru. Great, thank you very much. Andres, uh, we, we've seen this beginning to happen in, in the oil sector. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, you know, I would, I'd start with the uh, mining sector as well, because uh, Lopez Obrador during his campaign and in the first months of his administration also made a big uh, pitch for uh, opening up or looking up again at the mining contracts and the mining industry in Mexico. Uh, as well as the hydrocarbon and electricity sectors. Um, and uh, the, the fact is, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, there has been very little that has been achieved uh, in the three years so far. Uh, he, he railed about uh, how uh, some 80% of Mexico's territorial uh, 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 surface had been conce concessioned out to mining industry and mining interests and so on, which isn't true, by the way, like many of the things that he says in his morning pressers and in his speeches. Uh, but 
The one issue that I think, among others, that has, uh, shall we say, changed the rhetoric from him is, of course, the trilateral uh, USMCA or TMEC, uh, because all mining interests in Mexico are either Canadian, American or Mexican. And uh, if he were to go against any of these uh, existing concessions, uh, he would uh, run up against uh, problems within the uh, international obligations that Mexico has. Um, and this is also true of the energy sector, although there it's a bit more diversified because we have European and other uh, energy interests in Mexico. But uh, as far as the mining sector is concerned, I think the biggest uh, break on him doing anything more than has already been uh, announced uh, is 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 probably pretty pretty uh, important. Now, just like Lucia, uh, there is a clear intention, and I think this will come up uh, very soon in the fall, uh, of looking at a fiscal reform uh, for Mexico. And in that fiscal reform, I I am sure that they will find ways to tax the uh, resource-based uh, sector uh, considerably, uh, more than is the case today. So uh, from that perspective, I think, uh, you know, for many years, for many, for centuries, uh, Mexican concessions in the mining sector uh, didn't cost almost anything uh, to the federal government. Uh, they were... Uh, there was, there was no um, resource-based tax. It was all a, a tax just on the uh, surface of the territorial concession. And it was already uh, about 20 years ago that they began taxing the resource itself. And I think that now there will probably be more, uh, there will be more taxes on the resource than is the case today. Uh, and that's probably something that's good because, uh, uh, you know, in Mexico, unlike in the United States, for example, uh, mining concessions are only for the uh, surface of the territory involved. The minerals below surface belong to the state and uh, therefore the uh, people, the companies that have the concessions have to pay the state uh, royalties for those uh, resources that they uh, produce. Uh, Chris, if yeah. I may? Yes, please. I, I just want to say that what I'm doing uh, is I interpreting, uh, I'm trying to understand what Castillo's people are, are saying, but the fact of the matter is that we don't really know because his yeah. agenda is very much open and he has no uh, real um, strong economic energy or international team. Uh, so we will need to, you know, follow this agenda or follow this team uh, a couple of more days in order to see if he starts showing with people with a specific international policy agendas or economic agendas, because otherwise everything is really uncertain. Yeah, no, and it's a very, I mean, you have, sort of a hardline leftist leader like Cerrón, who's one of his party's founders, as well as now Franke and others. So it's it's difficult reading the, the tea leaves, or I guess the coca leaves of, of Peru right now. Um, the one last question from Catalina Cairo. Um, Catalina, did you want to speak up and then we'll... Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so I had a, a question or two quick questions actually for Lucia. Um, first, um, so I find it quite uh, puzzling that some left-leaning constitu constituencies uh, supported Castillo, given that um, he's socially conservative. So I was wondering if you could expand a bit uh, more about the composition of his voter uh, base to sort of understand a bit, uh, a bit more what's uh, going on in Peru. And then uh, the second question, I mean, if, if Castillo were to come to power, um, I would, you know, I'd like to hear a bit more about what his government would look like, um, you know, how he's planning to sort of populate the government. Is he likely to build um, alliances with existing uh, like-minded politicians? I mean, what, what are we to expect? Yeah, thank you, you, answer, you, we have one last question at Asker. 
So, uh, so Kevin Nichols, why don't you introduce yourself, unmute yourself and ask your question and then we'll let the panelists respond. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for the presentations. I just had a question about uh, pension reform uh, in Peru. Uh, what's, if there are any latest updates and uh, your opinion on how a Castillo government would uh, approach the private pension system uh, in Peru? Uh, thank you. Thanks. Um, Carolina, I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I knew how this uh, is going to unfold. My sense is that the left wing in Lima the more uh, social democrat uh, type of, uh, of constituency, both for him because of Keiko's Fujimori um, description of really not uh, democratic processes. Um, and how, for instance, she said that she will uh, give an indulto to his father, to her father, uh, Alberto Fujimori. And of course that was very difficult for many to handle. Um, my sense is that uh, he got, of course, the vote from, you know, everywhere else but Lima. And because everywhere else but Lima is not as, you know, integrated in globalization, is not, uh, is uh, unintegrated with the neoliberal model. Um, you know, people are dying uh, we, without oxygen, people are dying without food, and, and the problems that regular Peruvians are facing are more uh, related to Castillos than Keiko Fujimori or Kuczynski or anyone else from the elite, for that matter. How he is going to organize his government? I don't know. That's a huge question. And Veronica Mendoza from the Democratic um, you know, left-wing party, uh, she is uh, helping him uh, and we are waiting to see if some of her, uh, you know, advisors and experts are going to be part of that government. But that's a huge decision to make because judicialization of politics is happening all the time in Peru. So if you actually take, um, you know, you jump into the to the public sector, then you can be in jail after a bit, a little bit of time because of corruption or you know uh, illegal practices. So um, everything is up, you know, for for understanding in the next perhaps a couple of weeks. Um, there are many questions for Castillo to answer regarding who how he is going to actually organize a government who is going to be in charge, for instance, of uh, foreign policy. In some areas, he will just leave things to move the way they are, such as perhaps armed forces, the police, foreign policy, and he will try to concentrate on social issues and uh, you know, anti-COVID uh, policies and some structural reforms. And that will move to Kevin's question. Of course, pension reform is going to be high in the agenda because uh, where the system uh, was born here in Chile is going to be also uh, high in the agenda. You know, uh, the, the IFP system who was created here in Chile, um, soon enough is going to be dead or is going to be structurally transformed here in Chile. So there is a lot of uh, space for debating in Peru to also, you know, close that down. However, in Congress, Castillo has no real leverage to even move that agenda forward. So uh, this is going to be a government that will be unable to actually implement any important reform, even the pension reform. Well, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it was a very rich discussion. Um, I'm not gonna try to summarize it, uh, but I do think you know one interesting contrast between the two, and as a comparativist, I'm always looking for similarities and contrasts, is, is in the case of Mexico, it, one could argue that what we see is the triumph of institutions, even party institutions that cohered, offered an alternative, uh, and, and will continue to probably bolster uh, uh, Mexican democracy and its and its and, and serve as ballast for its economic policy. In contrast, you see Peru, which is the risk of no 
uh, weakened and even collapsed into institutions, party systems, parties themselves, um, the military even trying to guess where the military can go, um, the Congress, uh, th this level of uncertainty and unpredictability is, is, is very difficult for politics and for economics. Obviously though, Peru has some real resources and, and successes in terms of its economic policy making. Hopefully that will sustain it until it can reconstruct some of these institutions. So I wanna thank our two panelists. Uh, I learned a lot, also had fun, but I have a very perverse sense of fun. Uh, so I wanna thank both of you, Andres and, and Lucy. I hope we have to, hope to have you back um, in person at some point even soon. Uh, and I wanna thank our, our funders, uh, Fresnillo, BG, BTG Pactual, Equinor, HSBC and Karen Energy. And uh, please stay tuned. We'll be doing a lot more of these. There's a lot more elections uh, in Latin America. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate this.